Ladies and gentlemen, today our speaker is Professor Michael Lacey from Georgia Tech, who will talk about polynomial Roth theorems. Michael, the audience is all yours. As always, I ask everyone to just mute yourself and unmute as you see fit to, to, to ask questions. Oh, oh, wait, uh, wait a minute, was it polynomial Roth theorems or which I'm, I can... Uh, what I have is a polynomial Roth theorem for corners okay. in the finite field setting, but any talk we will be enjoying uh, equally. Uh, right, just a second. Yeah. Um, okay, let me just, that talk is ready. And um, scrolling direction, horizontal, polynomial corners and finite fields. Hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. It's also also on the East Coast, even further south. It's not so pleasant and here in Atlanta. So uh, the polynomial corners and finite fields. This is um, a recent result of mine uh, by with um, Ri Han, who's at Louisiana State University and Fan Yang, who is uh, holds position at the Australian National University. So it's inter <laughs> I hear some. All right. So, um, so the the point of connection here is the Roth theorem, uh, of which there's a few. Of the one, the particular one I'm interested in is the one on three-term arithmetic progressions. So an example of an arithmetic progression is x1, x1 plus y1, x1 plus 2, y2. And uh, I'm, the version I'm stating a particular interest here is on some sort of quantitative versions. And so I'm, I'm, uh, this version is um, this, this wonderful recent breakthrough of Thomas Bloom and Oliver Sisak that if A is contained in one to N and the cardinality of A satisfies this logarithmic condition. So it's N divided by log N to just uh, a power just less than one, then A contains three term APs, um, of which the example, uh, the, the red, points mark one example and another one is another example. And so it's typical that once A meets these density thresholds that in fact there's an abundant number of arithmetic progressions. Now the raw theorem is, um, this version of the raw theorem is one that I've spent a lot of time on because it is also closely connected to multilinear harmonic analysis. The, uh, especially the bilinear Hilbert transform. The Roth theorem is generalized to Zimmeretti's theorem on longer arithmetic progressions. And the Zimmeretti theorem quite famously was given an alternate proof by Hillel Furstenberg, who uh, defined these uh, multilinear ergodic averages uh, when, and uh, Associated with that is the host crawl nil flows. There's also nonlinear versions, which are the main um, emphasis of this talk, especially the, the um, first result of Sarkozy, as well as the Bergelson Liebman polynomial ergodic theorem that I'll state later. So lots of different interconnections. Um, this, is, this is Klaus Roth, who who's received the Fields Medal for his work in algebraic number theory. The, the three-term AP theorem is what I just mentioned. And I've also worked on the discrepancy theorem, the famous discrepancy result of his. Now, the, the, an important theme here is that if you, if you break the arithmetic progression in the sense that you in, introduce a nonlinearity, um, especially by way of a polynomial, that things become much easier. And this was um, a wonderful uh, result of um, 
was first identified, this wonderful result of Jean Borgan and Mei Kui Cheng, which um, considers a nonlinear uh, progression, a polynomial progression, x, x plus y, x plus y squared. And so the significance here is that you work in a setting, you, well, first you work in FP. So rather than Zn, you work in FP and you can, and the point is that, that A can, is allowed to be much smaller. The logarithmic bounds of Bloom and, recently established by Bloom and Sisak, in this case is a power savings, right? A can be as, just has to be as big as P to the one minus Delta and Delta's an eighth or something like that. Um, so the, the nonlinearity allowed some sort of significant improvement uh, in the density condition that you can place on A. I, I didn't say it before, but of course the interest here is that, you know, the hypothesis is this, this is always this density type condition, but the conclusion is of a completely different character. It, it's some sort of arithmetic type conclusion. All right, so the nonlinear setting leads to huge improvements over the linear setting um, of arithmetic progressions and, and what um, the core of the Borgan Chang result was um, a kind of local smoothing estimate that you set up some sort of average, averaging a, in this case, a bilinear averaging operator that is has f of x plus y and then f of x plus y squared and the average is over the entire finite field. Then the av this averaging operator is very close to what would happen if these were independent shifts, right? If these were independent shifts, some sort of random selection, then you'd expect to see the expectation here and, and that's almost what you get. Well, the, um, the um, work of um, uh, Borgen and Chang was followed up by, um, I wanna highlight two, two groups of workers, the Chao Chun Li, uh, Dong Dong and Sawen, um, but then uh, whose methods I'll come back to, um, they generalized it to two linearly independent polynomials, but Sarah Palouz, um, came across the striking generalizations of the Borgan Chang result and can address longer polynomial progressions, again, with a power savings in the finite field setting, which is a very striking result. And that this is even lifted to the integers. So the and work with Sarah Palouz and Sean Prindeville. Um, they can address longer arithmetic polynomial progressions. So X, X plus P1 up to X plus P to the, e to the K, P sub K. These are polynomials that are, are integral in the sense, and by which I mean P of zero is zero and P of Z is, is contained in Z. So if you have integral polynomials of different degrees, um, if A again satisfies a logarithmic type density condition, then the set contains a polynomial progression. And of course, C here is allowed to be very small as, as a function of the polynomials. Again, this is a striking result because if you were to take, take not a polynomial progression, but a four term arithmetic progression, no result like this type is known. Yes, dense sets contain four-term arithmetic regressions, but there's no logarithmic type density condition known 
in this level of generality. In the linear case. So what's a corner? A corner in the context that I talk about it is a generalization of a three term progression. And in the in the linear case, a corner is, is three points in the plane x and then x shifted over in the first coordinate by some amount and then x shifted up some other amount in the second coordinate. This is a generalization of an arithmetic progression, a linear arithmetic progression, because if you kind of project it a corner down through an appropriately selected projection, what you get is a three-term AP. So if you knew that you're set, so you can deduce things about linear uh, one dimensional progressions from results about corners. And the Bergelson um, Liebman theorem that I alluded to before says that polynomial corners exist. So it's this, um, again, you take these linear, they can be, uh, you take these, these uh, um, integral polynomials, let's just assume they're of different degree, then for any density level delta, there's an N delta, which could be very, very big. So that if, if N is bigger and A, is in the k-dimensional set and the k-dimensional cube where k is the length of your polynomial corner and the density is big, then A contains a polynomial corner where you shift by a different polynomial amount and each coordinate axis. So this is the corners version of the, the Palouse Prindeville result, but there's no guarantee on how small this N delta is a, can be. So there's a um, picture of Vitaly Bergelson at, uh, at uh, Oberwolfach and, and a polynomial corner where x plus y in the first coordinate plus y squared in the second and a y cubed in the third. Okay, well, uh, so we have this um, bergelson lieben result. What, what is known quantitatively and the quantitative bounds um, for just the two dimensional corner is a, is a result of uh, Shkredov. It's a, a, uh, it, the key point is that it addresses the linear corner situation. So X plus Y in the first, you shift by Y in the first coordinate and Y in the second. So this is the literal anal corner analog of the Roth theorem. And so you take a and n squared, and and the and the key point here is that the density condition has to be relaxed to log log c. So a has to so rather than a simple a simple log, it's a log log for this linear corner. So the, the, why is this the case? Why is this so much worse? Well, the, the, if you're in the setting of the Roth theorem, uh, it's actually kind of, it's interesting to pass up to the ergodic theory setting. And in the ergodic theory setting, you're dealing with one linear transformation. And uh, then the host craw theory uh, tells you that the, the linear transformation has a nil flow part 
and a random part. And then the structure, so the structure theory there is actually very strong. In the corners setting, the ergodic theory is of two commuting transforms, namely the shift in the X in the first coordinate generates one transform, the shift in the second coordinate generates a second transform, and you don't know much about them except they commute. So then the just much less is known. So for instance, the finite field version of Shkratov's theorem is still double logarithmic. Um, so it's just, uh, there's something, so these, these, in general, these corners questions are just of a different character completely. But that's a kind of rough heuristic and it's not always accurate. So it, in the finite field setting, there is a polynomial Roth theorem for corners that has a power gain. So this was some, somehow a surprise uh, when we discovered it. So you let P1 and P2 be two integer polynomials with distinct degrees. Then there's a delta positive so that if A is a subset of FP cross FP and the cardinality of A satisfies this power loss condition, then A contains a polynomial corner. Um, so this, so maybe I should add um, E1 and E2, meaning the shift and different coordinate axes so X is, X is two dimensional, this is a basis vector and this is a basis vector. Um, so as I said, this was um, a sort of a surprise and I think it indicates that um, the, the corner situation again in the polynomial setting might allow for some better results than you might uh, normally expect. So the, the raw theorem uh, actually proved in the 1950s is actually still a kind of a, an interesting proof to read. And um, all the way back in, in his paper, he is, is already counting the number of progressions. So the, the counting, the count, to count the number of progressions in a set, you need a trilinear form. Uh, so F1, F2, and F3. And so then F3 just set is just F3 of X. And you take F of um, one polynomial, let's, let's just say it's linear plus E1, and then uh, F2 with another polynomial, say it's Q of E2. And then what you want to show in this finite field setting is that the trilinear form is bigger than, uh, well, essentially this term, the trilinear form evaluated with F1, F2, and F3, being the indicator of a set is at least as big as the probability of the set cubed, which is the answer you expect if A is selected at random, minus something that has po uh, power decay. And as soon as you have this, then you have the theorem. Um, so you see that multilinear uh, uh, harmonic analysis is already entering in, and the, it's it's convenient to uh, study the 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 uh, to view the trilinear form as an inner product, and then you have a bilinear operator, which is. Um, 
uh, F1 and you shift by a polynomial amount in the first coordinate times X2 and F2 where you take X1 and you shift by a polynomial amount in the second coordinate. Now X1 and X2 are both members of FP and this is a function on FP squared and the expectation is Y over FP as well. So then there's essentially two lemmas. The, the proof consists of two lemmas. The first one is that if you take A and you compare it to the product of the expectations, that you get a small number. And now the, of course here, the, the, again, the rationale is that if, F, if, if this were really a shift by a random uh, amount and this a shift by another independent random amount, then the, uh, the, the bilinear operator would literally be equal to this. And so you're just showing that, it, that the, these polynomial shifts act like independent shifts. And the, then the second lemma, which is um, elementary, is that if you take the, they take the set and you take the indicator of the set, expectation in the first coordinate times expectation in the second coordinate, then that's at least the expectation cubed, which is um, just an elementary argument. Then the proof of the theorem is the trilinear form is at least the expectation of A cubed minus a polynomial decay and then you work and then you have the proof of the theorem. So uh, I just want to, the, the proof of this is uh, um, sort, of, sort of easy and hard. And in a certain sense, it's the wrong proof. But uh, um, so we, we lean on the approach of Chao Chun Li, Dong Dong, and Will Sawan. And um, in particular, they identified uh, these, uh, the usefulness of these uh, wonderful exponential sum estimates due to Nicholas Katz, which I'll sort of briefly point to shortly. This is um, right. So the so we work on a finite field, and the finite field has a, a discrete Fourier transform. It has Planchereau, it has Hausdorff Young, it has all of these inequalities that we know already, but although everything is completely discrete. Um, and so the proof is Fourier analytic in that sense. And so you express the bilinear average and Fourier variables and analyze the kernel. Right. So then you, you assign to, I've, I've done this implicitly already in my notation, but just to say it a little more formally, FP squared, you give it counting measure that normalized to total measure one. And then the Fourier transform space has counting measure. So every point has unit mass. And then if, if M is an FP squared, F hat is the expectation. And here I'm just emphasizing it's expectation over FP squared of F of X e to the minus two pi i X dot M, where X is two dimensional and M is two dimensional. So this, we interpret this as the dot product on FP. And they have the Plancherel reconstruction formula um, And then you, um, 
you take the bilinear average and it's it's written out here again it, i guess in this in this language i'm doing a linear shift in the first coordinate and a polynomial shift in the second coordinate and you expand f1 in fourier variables you expand f2 in fourier variables leaving you this and then you get the fourier transform of the kernel sitting here and the kernel is again an object on fp squared with the first coordinate coming from here and the second coordinate coming from there. Um, now, the at this point, I, uh, a lot depends upon the fine properties of this kernel. Um, there is a, a, a very useful fact, which you can't use all by itself, but the the kernel if you're the kernel is small because if, if you're as long as you're not zero you always have this square root decay uh, keep in mind this is y is an fp so i'm summing i'm averaging p elements here so this says uh, that i get square root cancellation and this level of generality, that is the result of uh, the famous result of Andre Bay from 1947. And now from the bilinear average, we're, we are subtracting the product of the, two, of the expectation, f of x1 and f1, which is only a function of x2, and the expectation of f2 in the second coordinate, which is only a function of x1, this is exactly equal to this part of the Fourier expansion, where I put the zero in X1 and the zero, the zero mode goes right here on F2. So the hard term to, and so then you subtract that off and there's different terms. The hard one to, to estimate is, uh, is this one again the, the proof is completely elementary but probably too too hard to hope to absorb even if you're trying to keep your mind off a snowstorm outside um the hard term there's a hard term where you use um which is some sort of uh it looks like a convolution and right here um and after some completely elementary but rather detailed computations, the bound reduces to uniform estimates over exponential sums. So the many steps are easy, Plancherel, Hausdorff, Young, until you, but at some point you wind up needing a deep inequality on exponential sums. So as I as I already said, the the vial estimates for general functions for for pretty general functions f um, you put you put the arithmetic character and inside the arithmetic character you can put a wide class of polynomials. And you take the um, sum over all of f p, so you're summing p elements and you have square root order of magnitude, square root cancellation. So what Chao Chun Li, Dong Dong, and Will Solon recognized was that buried deep in this question is a much more complicated sum. It's a sum over um y1 at y2 y3 y4 and uh fp now these these four variables have to satisfy us wind up satisfying an algebraic condition which is an explicit but complicated condition 
that depends upon the input polynomials uh, that the polynomials that you start with. And then you sum the arithmetic character evaluated at another polynomial H evaluated at Y1, Y2, Y3, and Y4. So you have four variables here, a, a polynomial constraint. So one over P cubed is the correct normalization. Um, and so you see that this is a um, some sort of complete exponential sum over some sort of algebraic surface uh, evaluated at some other algebraic expression along the surface. And the, the results of Nicholas Katz extends the VE estimates to um, such kind of setting, giving you, again, an extraordinary square root gain um, over the trivial estimates, subject to non-degeneracy conditions on G and H, which are expressed in terms of gradients and and uh, in particular, if the initial polynomials start that you start off with have different degrees, you can verify that uh, Katz's conditions hold. So uh, it's it's a it's a funny argument because it's completely it, you just begin in a completely elementary way and use all all kinds of elementary tricks until you wind up at a place where you use this extraordinary result to finish. Well, the um, um, this this may be a kind of a short lecture, I guess. I wasn't didn't I thought it was a little longer, but the the as I as I said, this is um, on the one hand, it's a very promising result because it does indicate that there may be a better and richer theory associated with these corners in a polynomial setting. On the other, the if to, to seek such results, you certainly need a different proof than the one we we discovered. Um, what we the the argument that we've we have down in this finite field case, in particular, relying on the result of Nets Katz, can't really be used to establish a Z inversion. It couldn't be used to establish to study longer polynomial progressions either. Another um, less sophisticated, but probably much more complicated approach would, probably, would be needed. Um, it would be great to establish continuous versions of these results, as well as to the higher dimensional corners setting also would require, um, again, probably a much more complicated, uh, but a much longer, but completely elementary proof. Um, so somehow I think you guys let me talk too quickly. Michael, first of all, uh, thank you so much for a great talk. That, that there is uh, one thing I have learned over the years is that no one ever complains when the talk is shorter, but some people do tend to complain when the talks go over the time. So in that sense, well, it's it's in it that was, sense, it's a complete success. Perfect success. But I also want to apologize to you and the audience because I think I may have misled you indirectly when I mentioned the Roth theorem. I was uh, quoting from the email that, that that you sent me last week for the for your talk. But I think we have forgot to change, and we have sent out an email with a title that you mentioned to us half a year ago. So if you, I, I'm not sure well, how, what to suggest. Well, I, 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 the other talk is actually prepared, but I don't suggest that I give it. So that's what I was thinking was that maybe if you could, if you would agree to give that talk maybe in the fall or, or, or later, then we could pretend okay. that my faux pas 
is is, no, is I, really I'm an not elaborate sure. I'm not attempt sure. to have you speak twice in our seminar. No, no, okay. Well, so certainly I won't. Uh, it's, I'm happy to give either talk. Awesome. Uh, in that case, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions to Professor Lacey, please unmute yourself and, and ask. Well, I realize uh, so many of you probably are not really familiar with this work, but I, I just let me say the the work of um, Sarah Palouse is really kind of remarkable. Um, she is able to establish the existence of these longer polynomial progressions, and her tools are uh, uh, extraordinarily large and very clever applications of Cauchy Schwartz. So very ingenious work. Hi, Marcus, this is Alex Sokolos. Uh, how, how constructive, uh, how practical these things are? So do we have examples, specific examples of sets and, and polynomials or AGS kind of existing theorem? Um, so the, Alex, the, the, the question of, of what these sets of what these sets might look like that avoid three-term arithmetic progression is itself a fascinating question. And the best, con the best constructions actually go back again like 60 years and no one's been able to budge them. Um, there's, um, there's a construction of Rankin, really just a few, you, you, I could describe it in just a few minutes of a set that contains no Three-term arithmetic progressions. It's it's very tiny compared to to the Bloom Sisak result, and the real connection is really not known. Um, if you there's another theorem which I didn't state explicitly, perhaps I could have, where you look for three-term progressions and f three to the n. So take the three-term finite field raise it to the nth power. The notion of the arithmetic progression makes sense. And you can, and the Roth theorem holds in that context. Now sets, this was actually the subject of his great breakthrough by Ernie Crute and Jordan Ellenberg and Terry Tao to show that such sets, sets in F3 to the end that avoid three-term arithmetic progression are exponentially small. Again, the power savings. The analog of that for corners is, is just not known. I'm, I, so the, the corner situation is very hard and we don't know how to construct the bad sets. Thank you. Any other question or comments or, or, or suggestions? If not, let us thank our speaker again. Let me thank our speaker on, on, on all of your behalf. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for, for your attention, Michael. Thank you for, for, for a great talk. Uh, I, I, I hope to see everyone next week again at the next faraway Fourier talk.